love and um, support. That must have felt like something for you. Yes. I guess I will start off and give a description of Juneteenth for anyone who doesn't know. I did not learn what June 19th, lovingly called Juneteenth. I did not learn what Juneteenth was in school. I learned it in my kitchen. My grandmother taught me. So imagine, imagine that the world's biggest news, the biggest thing that would ever happen to you, imagine that happened. Mm -hmm. And for two years, you did not know it happened. That's Juneteenth. Yeah. Juneteenth is the celebration of when a group of slaves in Texas <laughs> found out that two years ago that President Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation, that two and a half years ago that they were free. So as the word started to come out two years prior, as the army started to get close to where slaves were, slaves were here, oh, they're close. <laughs> so we're free. And then they were run off and run away from that plantation. Like, master ain't gonna get me. <laughs> but yeah, right? unbelievable. So yeah, there's no slaves social were media. freed and no, no one told them. Let me tweet Bonita that we free. <laughs> <laughs> so all the greedy slave owners are like uh let's keep this under wraps because yeah <laughs> that's what juneteenth is juneteenth is the celebration of everyone coming to know that slavery was abolished in mm -hmm. the u.s because you got to think about it back then something may happen but it doesn't trickle down even after the civil war was over people were still dying Hey, did you hear that they stopped the, ow, you just shot me in my butt cheeks. They, they didn't know the war was over, so they still fighting. So it took a while. That I did not know. Yeah, it took a while across the board. Every time something happened, it wasn't like now where it's instant. Like right now, we're talking to people all over the world through our network. They're instantly finding out something. But back in the day, I would have to ride a horse over to your house. Hey, Bonita. Happy belated Juneteenth. And then <laughs> you get on a boat. <laughs> and then say, hey, two months ago, all you people, happy Juneteenth. So that's what Juneteenth and, is. You know, we're joking about it taking two years for the word to get around, but it's all taken 100 years for the white people in our country to hear about it. So times have not really changed that much. Look at that. Oh, I know, right? Look at that. Yeah. I think it really just comes down to who you're with. If you yeah. keep hanging with the same old people, you would keep having the same old information. Mm -hmm. but when you listen to someone new, when you listen to a new program, when you talk to a new person, you have new ideas, you have new thoughts. So that's yeah. why it's very, very helpful to do that. Very helpful. That's true. Actually, as I told you, the, the reason I knew about this very important holiday it's a day that literally changed our nation in an instant. Yeah. The yeah. day, the, yeah. I mean, like this has impacted every aspect of our, of the United States. From that moment on, it was a new world. Mm -hmm. May have taken a couple of years to kickstart, but it was still there. And the reason I knew about it was because a, a former chef and I needed to know all the important holidays to know when to give you know, I had international staff always, so I didn't know all the holidays. So it's not that I'm a super enlightened aware person. I was never taught this in school. You know, I knew, I mean, I'm enlightened in that I care about honoring my employees and their holidays. <laughs> so making sure that, you know, if it fits the schedule, everyone can celebrate what's important to them in their personal life. But it's shocking to me that the only reason I knew about it was to schedule days off 
not because this important moment in history was shared with us when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I just was brought a huge bummer to our conversation and you're all about inspiration. <laughs> so I'll tell you one thing that's inspiring is mm -hmm. that when you look at any holiday from any culture, that the holiday is celebrating something good. The mm -hmm. holiday is celebrating the essence of spreading the good news. That's what Juneteenth is about, spreading the good news. Yep. And now more than ever, we need to spread in the good news. So we have yep. George Floyd that's going on. We have protesting, then we have rioting, and now we have people talking about how can we change the system, what things are broken. This is the time for good news. And the mm -hmm. only way, the only time in the zeitgeist of history have things really changed and went to another level were when two people or more were talking. Mm -hmm. We're sharing of ideas and sharing of thoughts and just the belief, and we have to believe. So I'm gonna put a bold statement out there with you, Benita, really bold. And if this statement is not true, then we are doomed. Uh -oh. The people who aren't listening to this don't believe what I'm saying then we are doomed. Mm -hmm. And that statement is, one person can make a difference on the world. This is true. One person can make a difference on the world. That you, as one person, can make a difference in the world. If that statement isn't true, we're doomed. No, this statement is absolutely true. It's been proven time and again. And you know what? Like, I honestly think that yesterday is going to go down in the history books as the day the world changed again. I do. And I think that going forward, Juneteenth will be celebrated as you see it. A day of change, a day of growth, a day of unity, a day of opportunities. Yeah, amazing. If you think about it, if you go back probably almost two years, mm -hmm. um, the statement Black Lives Matter was controversial. Now, yeah. you know, Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. Why just Black Lives? You know, this is like a big argument coming out. Now, everybody and their mama saying Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Asian people, black Lives Matter. White people, Black Lives Matter. Black people, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> yeah, and it was five years ago that that Grandma. statement, five years ago. Five years ago, I was uh, trying to change laws in Virginia so that special needs youth would not be arrested for no reason, which uh -huh. was happening at an alarming rate. And I was saying, you know, support the special needs community, stop putting them in jail, just because they're like low maintenance and easy to just cram in there without issue. You know, they don't join the gangs. They're like nonviolent by nature, honest by nature. So just cram them in the jails. And I was like, when the Black Lives Matter protests started in Baltimore and all of a sudden people who are so fickle who were actually supporting our movement said, how dare you take attention away from Black Lives Matter? And I'd say, what do you think is the number one community in juvenile detention and prison for false or overcharged, you know, arrest is special needs black youth, low income special needs black youth, the number one community. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I say special needs lives matter, don't say I'm not saying black lives matter, but you know, um, now, when I say Black Lives Matter, I know I'm supporting my community, which yeah. is why I say all communities need to step up and say, do not say in response, all lives matter. Of course, all lives matter. Say in response, when we, everyone supports Black Lives Matter, then we're supporting our own communities as well, which is a lot of what you do when you go out in the world. You get communities to focus on the areas that need support and then grow their entire group, right? So I thought about something last night and mm. I'm gonna say it for the first time uh, out loud, okay? So hope it isn't that crazy. Uh, well, maybe it's a little crazy. So Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I sent, um, I did a post about a, two weeks ago on Instagram 
And there was someone, when I put Black Lives Matter, their response was, all lives matter, right? Why I say, it's Black Lives Matter. So um, this is what I have to say, and maybe it'll help people. If I decide to say, we need to save the dolphins. The dolphins and endangered species, we need to save the dolphins. If I say, save the dolphins, and your response is, we need to save the planet. <laughs> it's obvious <laughs> that by you saying that, it waters down the emphasis because someone is literally going after and trying to kill the dolphins. Right. Like somebody literally going after and trying to kill the planet. So when you hear Black Lives Matter, all right, me saying Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that your life matters less. It really means, hey, will you stop killing Black people, okay, mm -hmm. just because of the color of their skin? Because that's not cool. Just Black Lives Matter is shorter to say. <laughs> well, think about it. Okay, going back to your dolphin analogy, if we put in measures to make dolphins safe, everyone else around the dolphins becomes safe. Yeah. And if we put in measures, we're putting in measures to help clean the water, to protect the ocean life, to refurbish the environment, then the world is benefiting. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. So Black Lives Matter, Dolphins Matter. If we start there, the next thing you know, we can say, oh yeah, polar bears matter and, you know, Hispanic lives matter. Like, let's grow it outward. Absolutely. Everyone is always one action away from having a global impact. Everyone, mm -hmm. you, me, everyone is always one action away from having a global impact. And yeah. if we get to the point where we start chasing our life purpose, like Bonita has her life purpose. I got my life purpose. The people who are watching this have their life purpose. And it can all be different. But I believe if you do yours, I do mine, they do theirs, then a lot of these problems, poof, disappears. Mm -hmm. so you find that hashtag that's supposed to be tagged to your heart then that's when you are going to be able to have a global impact. When you find the hashtag that's supposed to be tagged to your heart, that's the time that you will blow up in a great way, have an impact on the world in a great way. But as long as you're just following others, oh, that's a cool hashtag. Let me slap that sucker on there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, we well, end up not standing for nothing. <laughs> but when you find yours and you boldly go for it, that's how things blew up. That's how it blew up for me. Because I started off with nothing. Single mama, speech impediment, um, poor, uh, and whatever I am today, it's because I found that hashtag that needed to be tagged in my life. And I kept going with it. Yeah. And now when you, um, like one of the things you do that blows my mind, when you go to India, mm -hmm. You don't speak Hindu, you don't speak Sanskrit, or you're, you're learning some. I'm, I'm amazed every time you come back, your languages, but you speak in English. Mm -hmm. You go out, and how many people show up to listen to you speak? Um, biggest audience I ever had, 800,000. It's in October, an ashram, Tutaji Maharaj. Uh, my Willpower Warrior event, we have thousands that show up for our event and then sometimes multiple thousands when I go to different colleges to speak and mm -hmm. sometimes two. <laughs> right. But when you go out, you don't just speak, you impact the local community. Yeah, when I die, that day is going to come. When I die, I do not want someone to say today a great speaker died. I want them to say today a great humanitarian died. Today, a man died whose programs will continue to live after him. Mm -hmm. I want to leave a mark on this planet that makes the world better 200 years after I'm no more. So when you have that type of mindset, then your days are different than other people's days. Other people are trying to they have different goals. And I'm not saying their goal is wrong 
I'm lying. Oh, I'm better than you. <laughs> My expiration date's going to be a little bit longer. <laughs> nah, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying mine is different. So if you want to understand me, if you're going to understand anybody, you have to understand what are the expiration dates of their goals. You look at a person's expiration date on their goals. That's going to mm -hmm. tell you about their character. That's going to tell you about their struggle. That's going to tell you about their future. And if I have an expiration date that's 200 years after I'm no more, after I'm dead, and somebody else's expiration date is 2020, we're going to be two different peas of a different pot. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we need all of that. We need yeah. all of it. But um, it's nice to have people like you who, I have to say, when I recall like Four years ago, you and I were sitting and talking and you were saying, Benita, I've made all this money. I have a nice lifestyle. I take care of my family. Everything is good. I don't know what to do with my money. I feel like I should be doing more. And that was only a few years ago. And you are now, you have, you support orphanages, schools, community organizations in multiple countries so that is like a huge and when you say all this money you people out there this is not like a multi-billionaire guy but when you're self-made and you have more money than you need and you have investments some of us everything after that we're like okay i'll take another holiday oh i'll retire early oh i'll do this or that this guy will harris he says what good can i do now you know, how can I, where can I put my drive? And you, you, in just a few years, have become a global impact. Hmm. Well, I think what happened with me, um, to be able to relate to everybody, all of us have a certain amount of money that once you make it, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really all you need to be abundantly happy. So right. if you are, are cold and you need a fire to warm you up and you go by the fire and you're three feet away from the fire, you're like, ooh. Oh my goodness, uh -huh. this warmth feels so good. Maybe I should stick my hand in the fire and I'll feel <laughs> even better. <laughs> ah! <laughs> that means only so much you need. So I got to a point, and for me, it was, I, I never forget, it, it was $112,000. Anything above $112,000, it was just excess. So See? do you just take it and just, ooh, or do you find a way to do something good with it? I think greed, greed is taking more than you give. So I think the universe is going to bless you with certain things. If it's two dollars, if it's two rupees, whatever you got, okay, take something from it and then use it to build something up. If it's, I got two legs, use one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get somewhere to help somebody out. But I hear all the time people saying, well, when I get money, then I'll help somebody. Or just, you just wait. You just wait till I have a little bit more time. And I'm, found, I'm like, man, you ain't never going to get that time. Mm -hmm. You got to earn it. And you earn it by using what you have now. Use what you love to fight what you hate. Or you'll always be stuck right there. I love that phrase. And I've heard you say it many times. Use what you love to fight what you hate. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key to your life purpose. That is how one person can make a difference. Listen, there are millions of singers out there. There's some pretty people too. There's some people that can be models. There's some people who are rich. There's people who are funny. There are people who are smart. But what makes an individual unique is the combination of the talents that were laid on your heart. It's the combination. It's the mixing of the two. It's your emotions. And most people just look like this and say, ooh, I know what I love, but they try to use what they love just to make money. And then the next thing you know, you have superstars, rock stars, actors, Bollywood people killing themselves, billionaires killing themselves because they use what they love just to make money. Mm -hmm. Or the other people who are jaded, who I know what I hate, this, I hate this, and this sucks, and this sucks, and I just wish, but they never do anything towards fighting that hate with that thing that they love. But when you use what you love to fight what you hate, 
that's what makes you rare. Right. That's what makes you rare. Not just, oh, I want to be one and, and the only, or I want to be unique. Try being rare. You know what rare is? Rare is someone who's consistent. Be rare. Rare is someone who can combine two disciplines that normally wouldn't be together, but you mix them together in order to make that magic secret, your chef, that magic secret food portion, like uh, honey mustard. One day somebody said, mm, I got some honey. That's, <laughs> that's some good honey. Another day somebody, mm, that's mustard. It's good. <laughs> honey mustard. And black people everywhere was happy. We got honey mustard pretzels. We got honey mustard fried chicken. So be rare. Stop being trying to be unique. Be rare and you'll be successful. One person can make a difference. Everybody is one action away from having a global change. We just have to ask, what action are you going to take? Love that. I love that. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to, I know we have people all over going, okay, how can I do this? Now that people know you are not some billionaire who then called in your board of directors to start a foundation in your name, you know, and you write checks, you are hands-on. And when you say you got money, it's not that you have billions of dollars. You just had extra money that you chose to do good with. You put this combination of tenacity, work ethic, inspiration, and some money. You rolled up your sleeves. You made a huge difference. Huge. How so did you get this you, combination? An example. Most people don't like talking about money. It's like, oh, I'll tell you who I voted for, but you want to know how much money I have? I'm like, well, what the hell? I mean, just anyway, I'll take, give you an example of money. So I went to Ghana, Africa. And when I went there, I saw 500 girls in a room uh, that could fit 100 comfortably. And these girls were sitting on top of each other. Some were barefooted. And it was a place called Elmina, Ghana. Elmina was the place where they used to cart Africans away into slavery. And there was this castle that had a sign that said, you will never, ever see this point again. So I'm at this School, it was an all girls school. And I'm uh, like, wow, they're poor. They're sitting on top of each other, wooden desk, and they're listening to the teacher. They're listening to the teacher, Bonita, like the words that were coming out of her mouth was oxygen for them to breathe. That's how intently these girls sitting on top of each other were listening to this teacher. So I asked the principal, you know, what's your greatest need? So I figured I'd donate a couple of dollars, then get some books or something like that. And she said, our greatest need is electricity. And that's when I looked around and noticed there was no light fixtures. I, I, I didn't even notice there's no light fixtures. There's nothing to plug electricity in. That these 500 girls were crammed into this 100 person room because they were chasing the sun. Because they were literally going to room to room based on where the sun was. And that was my last day there. And my boy who lived there, we decided to make it like a project. It cost me $2,000, $2,000 to get them electricity. Where we had the people in the local, somebody was an electrician, I bought materials, somebody else was able to wire it up, somebody else was able to call the electric company, the power company to get a string. The kids' parents started taking up collections so that every month they would be able to afford to pay for the electricity. $2,000, that's something that somebody working at McDonald's can do. But what happens is you get hit by the problem. And just seeing the problem forces the majority of people to say, oh, I can't do anything to just wipe this away. Mm -hmm. But when you look to see what you can do and start saying, I contributed to that problem that made me cry. If it doesn't make you cry, keep walking. But if it hits you and makes you cry, then just say, what can I do to contribute to it going down? And when you do and you drop that, you'd be surprised how many people rally behind you? $2,000 changed a generation of little girls in Elmina. And by the way, one block away 
one block away, the boys, they had electricity. So what kind of message are we sending when the boys' school has electricity and the girls' school do not? Now, you fast forward wow. three, four years, we got them a computer lab right before the coronavirus broke out. So now they have electricity, they got a computer lab, and while other villages will be locked out from the rest of the world, they got girl power. Oh my word. That is amazing. Yeah. And something that we all can do when you're yeah. willing to look. So here's a question. I know people who just heard that story are like blown away and very excited. They want to help, but maybe they're not, you know, they're at their home, they're in quarantine, they're not traveling the world, they're not seeing where the problems are. Do you have a foundation that they can contribute to? Mm -hmm. So the Willpower Humanitarian Foundation, if they go to my website, willpowerharris.com. Which we then, have in the comments here. And then if they click on about, they will see all about it and they can just contact me. But look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not trying to get anybody's money. I got my own and half the money my wife and I make, we donate to charity. And I don't like begging people for money. When I want to get something done, I want to get it done. The reason why I talk about this is I want people to know that I ain't special. I ain't special. <laughs> that means that whatever I do, you can do too. You can start a foundation with five damn dollars, but start one. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can be in your house, you can be on the quarantine, but you gotta start looking. If you're lazy, just say you're lazy. I would <laughs> rather hear people say, you know what? Someday I'm gonna help people a whole lot as soon as I stop being lazy. That's the truth. <laughs> oh man, I wish I wasn't so dumb. If I was a little <laughs> bit smarter, <laughs> I could help somebody. Say that truth. <laughs> Don't say, well, I'm gonna give me some money. Cause if you're dumb and lazy, you ain't gonna get no money anyway. That's the truth. <laughs> oh my God. But you are not calling people who are saying, Will, I'd like to donate to you, dumb and stupid. No, not at all. Not at all. No, but seriously, no, Will, this I know is true. I don't earn a, okay. I don't earn a lot of. A foundation, they're like, get to my foundation. Come on, hurry up. I'm telling you, don't get to my foundation. Don't give it to, I don't need your money. <laughs> but you may need to give. And if that's the case, if you need to give from your heart, then you do it. But don't think I'm out here asking you for money. We will help you without you. Well, let me be clear. The reason I asked. Yeah. It's like you and I took parallel roads, very different. You worked really hard, earned a lot of money so you could go out and roll up your sleeves and help the world. Yeah. I walked away from money, sold, gave away everything I owned mm -hmm. so that I am free to travel the world, roll up my sleeves and help people. So you got more headaches than I have. I know that for sure. <laughs> so we're on parallel roads, but even though like I'm on a inadvertent vow of poverty, I make sure that I donate money every week, every month. It's not a lot of, it's not a lot, but I'm telling you people, if you can go to Starbucks for a cup of coffee, or if you can get takeout, well, first of all, these days, if you're getting takeout from a mom and pop shop, you're helping your community. But if you have a spare of five or $10 in a week or a month, then you can put it to some organization you believe in and help the world and feel good about it. The problem is a lot of those organizations, you give them money and that money goes through the bureaucracy. It gets, pays all kinds. It's not going to what you care about. Right. When people donate money to you, Will, honestly, it's not anyone helping you. Yeah. They are helping the people you're helping mm -hmm. because they know that the money they give you is not going to your salary. It's not going to your bureaucracy. It's going to the cause that you care about, which is empowering young people around the world to have a chance and rise up and become the world leaders in whatever level. 
So let people give you money. <laughs> On that because they're not giving it to you they're giving it to these little girls they're giving it to the orphans they're giving it to like tell us about some of the kids around the world you've been helping because it's not just one little school in one country you're like spreading out mm -hmm. so we talked about Elmina Ghana let's talk about Kolkata so there was a um, girl and her we showcased her on my website who, um, it's a little hard to talk about, her father um, has started to make sexual advances to her. Oh my God. So she ended up going and speaking, it was like out of Bangladesh. And she ended up speaking to a NG, person in NGO and they rescued her out of that. And she was staying with them in West Bengal. Um, and she didn't have um, uh, a place to go. So my organization was able to sponsor her to get into um, a, a boarding school in Kolkata in order to avoid that. And now she's married and she has her own family. There's another... Um, oh village. my God. There's a you few saved villages. her life. Mm -hmm. and there's another few villages in uh, West Bengal who previously they had a lot of child marriages. And I went and I started talking to people and then it turns out that these parents love their kids as much as we love ours, but they can't afford to feed them. And in their mindset, the girls are not valuable. So let's marry them off so that somebody else can feed them, okay? So I figured if I can send the girls to school, and that's just the girls. But I want to send all the boys to school, too, in these villages. And if I send them both to school, then I can kill two birds with one loving stone. The boys would see the girls are just as smart as us, and that's smarter. Okay? Mm -hmm. The girls will be able to get some education and then be able to show their family how they can help them. So we did it. And then in two years, in these villages that we picked, we sent all the boys and all the girls. They had zero child marriages. Zero child marriages, because now the kids were going to school. And it was one thing after the other, right? So you start off with the books, and then from the books, then you have to start off paying with the teachers. And then from there, you're able to pay for the food while they're there. And you just learn what problems are ripple when you chase the evil. Because normally, you say evil, child marriages, in all child marriages, right? Well, let's drill down and see what's the evil that caused that, get to the root cause. And that's how I am. So it's not always about donating money. Sometimes it's about donating your time. Sometimes it's about donating your ear to listen. But the reason why I get so passionate is because I want people to know you don't have to just donate money, but you need to donate a piece of you. You gotta donate a part of you. And if there's nothing in you, then there's nothing to donate. That's when you gotta start with yourself. And when you start with yourself and plant that seed of love inside of you, then that grows to be great. And then you can give a little bit of your heart. And we give a little bit of your heart, then you're able to give a little bit of your money. When you give a little bit of your money, then you're able to see things continue to grow. But you don't step out the door and like Oprah's right there and like, hello, I got your million followers and all the people you can help and a billion dollars too. No, you take one step. And then a couple of years later, because I didn't, I forgot about you being in this crib right here, one level up, talking to me, and I'm talking to you and saying, I don't know what I want to do or where I want to go. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Um, but you just take one step. Yeah, and that was just like four years right. ago, I'm telling you. Yeah. And that's yeah. about it. If you're consistent for three years, then you can be a social media famous. But you got to be mm -hmm. consistent. Every day for three years, I work the Facebook that we're tied to now that has over 900,000 followers. Every, every day for three years, okay? When you look at YouTube channels and I'll scroll back and I see someone has been doing this for seven years. Somebody has been doing this for three years. So those people were listening and they want to be the next great Deepak Chopra or Wayne Dyer or whoever else. It's popping up, right? It takes you doing one thing 
for three years. Blood, sweat, and tears, and that's stopping, not waiting, keep going. I remember one time, Bonita, I was scheduled to be on the Hour of Power, Crystal Cathedral in, in California, and I was going to be seen by millions of people, and I was so happy. I told my mama, okay, my wife, myself, we got tickets, we're going to go, and I was going to become famous, famous. I was going to be there. This is my moment, and then two days before the event, it turned out that they booked two people on the same day for the Crystal Cathedral, and the pastor was like, all right, we won't have anybody. I'll just speak that day. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would be something that would crush you. But mm -hmm. I told them, listen, let me not go. And let the other guy go. Let the other guy go. Why ruin both our chances to get a good message out? I'd rather have somebody do it. And they're like, no, we're just not going to do it. Two weeks later, the Crystal Cathedral ended up going bankrupt. Now it's not there anymore. They had to move to backwoods, Ohio, Iowa, wherever they went. But you never know how things work out. And then mm -hmm. two years later, I'm giving the speech live in front of 800,000 people. So whatever your purpose is, if, you, if it's pure, if it's pure, and you're doing it not just to help you, but you're doing it and connecting it to helping someone else in another way, because we are one. We're one race. We're one caste. <laughs> we're one people, one planet. When you're thinking that way and your behavior lines up to your thinking, eventually you make it. You have to be consistent for three years and you just swallow that pill and be like, all right, I know I may be as good as boo-boo, but I got to go through doo-doo <laughs> for three years. And they don't teach you that in school. Yeah. That's what people don't say that. But if you want to be any type of consultant, teacher, at a global level, it's like people writing a book, right? Everybody writes books now. Just like everybody has TEDx now. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to do a book, I say, listen, you got to figure out your reasons why. And the reasons why are either it's a bucket list, okay? You want to serve as a business card, all right? Uh, you want to be famous, okay? You got to have no one of these three reasons. People are like, Oh, well, I don't want to be so bold to say that I want to be famous, but it'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, you got to pick one reason, because based on that reason, the process of doing books is totally different. You can't get rich off of no book. You can't. The margin of the book is like $3, unless you're going around speaking. If you're already famous and you're selling a book, well, you're just going to make money that way, but you're already rich. If you're going to have a book, you got to have a program. You got to have a class, something bigger. People are going to copy that book. I had somebody come up to me. God bless him. I love him. I see him in my head right now. He came up to me proudly and said, gee, I made copies of your book, and then I sold it for 50% of your price, right? He was so happy. <laughs> I just kissed them and gave them a hug. I was like, that's so good. Mwah. You ain't going to make no money with the books. Okay? The book should be a way to put down a philosophy, an idea that can be expounded upon through lectures, through training, through programs. And that's how you can expand and grow. But when you have something that somebody can just read and drop, you got famous people now, and I see them all the time on the, in all countries. Somebody has their book under their arm when they're on the train, have never even read it. The <laughs> author stopped being good five years ago. Nobody noticed because nobody's reading it because they want to look cool. You got look cool fame. Look cool fame meaning you got a lot of followers, but you ain't got no look cool money. You broke. <laughs> and poor people, the poor can't help the poor. I'm hungry. Me too. Somebody got to be rich. <laughs> well that's wild i mean i certainly have not gotten rich off my books and you have published how many books by now 11 are you rich off them i made some nice money because of the program of the, the program, program not the books like i did my first book did ten thousand 
um, downloads, 10,000 copies sold globally. Then from that, people started asking me to come out and speak. And from that, I had training programs. And from that, I get connected into corporations. So if yeah. you're looking at just the book alone, I wouldn't be driving or having two BMWs, his and hers. Mm -mm, mm -mm. We'd be having two BMW skateboards. Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> but just to be clear, your books, you write books on generally two areas. One is your business, like how you made your money, sales, marketing, yeah. accounts. The other one is uh, your inspirational books. Mm -hmm. So, so if people are looking for your inspirational books, they need to make sure. And business. Yeah. Spiritual and business. That's, that's what I am. I like to make money, and then I like to use it and give it away in some way. That's me. That's a good attitude. It works for me. Yeah. Now, how many countries are you in, and how many, What what's next? Like, because every time I talk to you, you're like, I'm like, how's everything in India? Oh, I'm not in India. I'm in Rome right now. Oh, I'm like, like you're spreading like wildfire around the globe. What's next? How far do you want to go? So um, in the last year, my business has become a global conglomerate. So from Bali to Baltimore, uh, we're everywhere. Uh, working with clients and doing sales training and now technical training and, ver and vertical. So what's next for me is empowering others to be able to use my platform to get their message out to um, as well. So that's what I'm doing in general. And then the funds that come in from my business side, I'm using it to build two orphanages in India, one in Ghana. It's like a willpower community where you have a meditation center. There you have an orphanage, senior citizens living. Uh, you have classes that people can come to from all over the world. Eventually, I want um, a business college in one location, a spirituality college in another, and willpower university that includes them on. My goals should be never ending. When your goals are ending, your life may be ending soon too. <laughs> so that's enough for me. I like empowering others. Mm -hmm. You once told me you wanted to fill the world with will willpower warriors, and these were warriors for change. And you mm -hmm. talked about like empowering the children because then they get the ethics of helping others as they grow up. Could you talk about that some more? Because that's mm -hmm. So Willpower Warriors is a, a progression uh, of three things. It started off online. When I had 200,000 uh, Facebook fans, I started to take on online helpers who were um, college kids scattered throughout India. And we would do coaching and guidance to kids online. Then when I went to India, the Willpower Warriors became people who donated their time on Sundays to go to orphanages, school for the blind, uh, senior living homes, government hospitals, and just every Sunday. And the next phase is that the Willpower Warriors becomes the children that are in our orphanages. Kindergarten, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, in India they call it standard, second standard, third standard, fourth standard. And I want the fifth standard kids to mentor the fourth, the fourth to mentor the third, the third to mentor the second, because I want them to know I'm responsible for taking care of my brother, for taking care of my sister. When they graduate, I want a wall of fame where when they donate back one rupee back to the school, that their name goes up on a wall of fame. Because at that moment, the whole system all right, begins helping each other and they no longer need a Will Harris. I want kindness to be a class, kindness. And that kindness should be just as important as science. When we have that, when we're teaching our students that, if you want a better world, start teaching a better lesson. So that's what's up. That's a good up. That is beautiful. So well, for the people who are watching this, who are saying, I wanna help, I wanna change the world, how do I get from where 
I am to even having the 200,000 Facebook followers. Like what was, what it, was it that you did that you felt like this is what made the difference in my effort to become a humanitarian? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that there's a series of steps. Mm -hmm. If I could give, I'll give one overarching mm -hmm. tip and then some guidance to scoop people along. The one overarching tip would be um, discover your message. What is the message that you're meant to share, experience, exchange with the world? What's your message? For me, it was use what you love to fight what you hate. Once you have a message, right, then you must begin building your tribe. You got to have a tribe. My tribe was Willpower Warriors. And these were a group of like-minded people who were able to uh, resonate, share, agree with. And then we were able to go out and do that. And all these other wonderful things happen. Okay. If you don't know your message yet, if you don't have a tribe, then at the very least, hang out with winners. You got to hang out with winners. I hang out with you. You hang out with me. Mm -hmm. We hang out with winners. We don't hang out with losers. And I'm going to call it the way it is. You hanging out with the people who want it. Oh, things ain't working. Because oh, it makes you feel a little bit better because your life isn't as crappy as theirs that day. Mm -mm. You need to cut that if you're trying to go to the next level. If you're trying to be the type of person that's going to have a massive impact. I'm talking massive impact. I'm not talking just TikTok or OK or oh, I'm doing all right. I'm talking about massive joy. Sometimes you got to leave the losers to go learn. And after you learn, then you come back and try to do something. You know two more words than them you're trying to teach them. Go learn the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I could rephrase that a little bit for him going, I want to be a winner. I don't think I'm a loser because those are, you're calling it like it is. They're harsh. Yeah, though. You so I like just want to fill it in a little yeah. bit. Mm. We all want to, you know, if you are a humanitarian person, you want to reach your hand out to those who need support, right? That's what you do. You reach your hand out. But when it comes up to who are you spending your time with? you're looking at people who will help you be inspired. So you're going after people who inspire you so that you can help the people who need inspiration if they're ready to be helped. Yeah. I think yeah. they're lacking the structure. They yeah. don't really understand how life works. And God bless them. Um, so when I run into people, I, I don't sugarcoat. I give it the way I see it. It's always just my opinion from what worked out for me. You have someone who can have a giving nature. Everyone should do that. Everyone should have a giving nature. But then you have people who aspire to be teachers. It's one thing to be in a class and I'm going to help another student study. It's another thing to be a student, have on student clothes and be like, all right, class, I'm the teacher. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> Just because you heard something good that the teacher said, yes, that'll make you the teacher. So that's what I mean, Vanita, yeah. that you need to know who you are, who you want to be, uh -huh. and then you align with that. Don't step into a role too soon to get educated just because there's not a doctorate degree in spirituality across the board. Doesn't mean you need to be going around, oh, I can just, you gotta be the message. And that's one of the things you have talked to me about over the years. Yeah. Plenty of temptation out on the road. You just can't speak the message. You got to be the message. And if you're stingy, you can't be talking to nobody about love. I'm keeping real with you. You're a liar. You're a liar. When you're going to go around talking to people about spirituality, no. That's like what ran people out of religion. So the yeah. thing that makes you successful, Benita, is that you practice what you teach. Mm -hmm. You are who you are. You are who you are on the camera, off the camera. So am I. And when you have people who are that way, 
that's when they start to go up. So that's what I mean. I say mm -hmm. it this way, because some people got to be smacked out of that habitual thinking of, yes, I just need yeah. one certification and I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah, people can spot a false prophet. Yeah. Like people may agree with you, they may not agree with you. They may be angry with you because they don't want to hear what you say. That's up to them to respond how they respond. But when you are saying something that is not your truth, that everyone can spot a mile away. Jeez. So we have a, a question here. First of all, um, Elizabeth, thank you for your comments. She said, when I was a child, I asked my parents what they wanted me to be. They said a good person. I didn't understand it until later in life. I love the idea of kindness training. Joan, so how did you find your message? Um, well, I, I think that the way you find your message is you use that system that I tell you. Use what you love to fight what you hate. So you first define all the things that you love to do with the ultimate passion that you would never get tired of, that you would do this thing for free. And then you find something that you hate and evil and injustice in the world. And you look at it in a silo. Most people may find a thing that they love that requires a skill, but they say, oh, I can't make money from that. You don't <laughs> judge it, all right? You identify it. If you don't know what it is, then that means you need to live like more. One of my friends uh, from high school, black guy, called me up and uh, he was listening to some Brazilian uh, Portuguese music. And I was like, what you listening to? That ain't rap music. And he said, listen, if you keep listening to the same old things, you have the same old ideas. I was like, oh. So you gotta see the world, you gotta experience the world. If you don't know what it is that you love, like with a high passion, then you need to talk to somebody who don't have the same color as you. Mm -hmm. You gotta go someplace where they have a different accent than you. You need to join a Facebook group that's just like basket weaving for people who love cats. Like I hate cats. Well, join it anyway. <laughs> Oh, no, we'll say it ain't true. Some people do hate cats. I'm just telling you, Benita, whatever it is, join a group different than your normal group, and you have different experiences. And you will either say, oh, I love that. Oh, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Days like that means that your life is going in a good direction. So for Elizabeth, use what you love to fight what you hate. Here's an example. Lady worked at Microsoft, mid-level engineer, depressed. Husband asked me to talk to her. She got sick, couldn't work anymore. I asked her, because now she's a stay-at-home mom, what is it that you love to do? She loved baking, cookies, cakes. I said, okay. What's an evil in the world that you see that you just take it too far? She said, battered spouses. I hate when I see that a woman was beat up by a man. Cookies, getting your butt beat. You know I'm going to put those two together. I suggested to her, use what you love to fight what you hate. So why don't you bake cookies for the local battered women's shelter? She did it. Immediately she had joy. Immediately. She baked cookies for the local battered women's shelter. And the news report did a report on her. Ex-Microsoft executive donates time and cookies to charity. The Bill Gates Foundation gave her some money. So now she's had like a full nonprofit based on using what she loved to fight what she hated. That's and amazing. Most people don't see like that way. Wow. Oh, you said wow. So that's the formula I use. That's the one I go around teaching people. That's the one I'm writing the book on right now. It's in my first book, Willpower Now, when I first started talking about it. Now it's just a matter of teaching people. So when you ask me, Benita, what's next? I'm 48. When you look at the progression of how a human life can go and have the maximum benefit in the 20s, you try anything and everything without hurting people, hopefully. And then that's when you really figure out, I love this. I really hate this existence. So by the 30s, you pick something, any something, right? Hopefully close to that love and hate 
So you can work for 10 years, takes 10 years of doing something to master it at the highest levels possible. So by the time you get to your 40s, that's why most presidents are going to 40s or over. By the time you get to your 40s, now you have mastered a skill in this particular area and you start matching it up to use what you love to fight what you ate. From 40 to 50, boom, you in the zone. <laughs> and by the time you get to your 50s, now you should be at the point where you're living to use what you love, to fight what you hate in some way. And that's what I'm doing with the mm -hmm. orphanages, with the speaking, with the businesses. But at the same time, I'm teaching people that message. So that the next level of gurus, the next level of educated people come through. And they begin to use that system or use what you love to fight what you hate. And you ride that sucker out. Mm -hmm. Ride it out. That sounds amazing. So, of course, I could talk to you all day. And I know people could listen to you talk all day because they line up in hundreds of thousands to do so. But it's definitely time for us to say goodbye for mm -hmm. now. You know, we're going to chat again. You know, you've raised so many questions. I'm like, okay, we're going to have to get together and just talk about <laughs> this element or that element. So guys, we're, we're going to say goodbye. Will, do you have anything you want to? Uh... I love you. I mean, I you, you. Nita, and I mean you that's watching this. If you are in, if you hear my voice, if you see my face, I want you to know I love you. If we never met, I love you. And I want nothing but the best for you because you deserve it that is beautiful that's beautiful you fill my heart Aww. <laughs> bye everyone and will and i will be back another time for sure bye bye